Hi, uh, this is a, a lecture being prepared for Math 310 at Simon Fraser University, spring of 2020. Uh, as you're aware, we have a exceptional situation on hand uh, where we're going to deliver the remainder of the lectures online. So I'm going to start uh, with here section 6.3. So we had half of this lecture actually done uh, when we last met, which was on uh, Wednesday last. Uh, so I'm going to redo that first part of lecture section 6.3 and then I'll finish lecture 6.3 and then uh, after that I'll in a separate video do um, section 6.4. So here we are 6.3 uh, step functions. Uh, why is the Laplace transform useful? We had this uh, at the, <laughs> the beginning of our last lecture. Again, why is it useful? And uh, so what we're going to see is that uh, and we'll be able to use Laplace transform to solve differential equations, which we cannot solve by any of the techniques that we've uh, seen before. And really the most useful thing is uh, that we'll be able to use a Laplace transform when the right-hand side, the forcing function, uh, is a piecewise continuous function. We have no mechanism for handling that with any of our previous um, uh, uh, methods, like for example, method of constant coefficients or the uh, variation of parameters. That does not work if the forcing function is not continuous. Okay, so we're going to just uh, get some uh, ability to represent our continuous, our discontinuous functions in a method that allows us to uh, work well uh, with them for the Laplace transform. So in order to do that, we're going to identify several types of functions and we're going to learn how to combine them in, into a uh, uh, representation of a large number of common discontinuous functions that you would see in engineering. Particularly, you see these coming up in mechanical and electrical engineering. Okay, so the first one is the unit step function, also known as the heavy side function. Uh, we are going to denote that uh, in the following manner. So we're going to denote that the unit step function in this manner, uh, u sub c of t. Okay, that is the uh, unit uh, step function at time c. So the step happens at time c. So let us uh, see exactly what that looks like if we define it uh, in its piecewise manner. It's going to be 0 if t is a less than c, and it's going to be equal to 1 if t is greater than or equal to c. So you see the, the value there c, this value here, okay, that is sitting right here telling you which time that the step happens at. Okay, so that looks like this uh, in a graph. Uh, it looks this way. We have uh, the nothing happening. We're coming along here. T is less than, less than C. And then right here is time C. And we uh, have an open circle there. And then we have the closed circle here. Uh, and it becomes 1. And it continues to be 1, this value here on the y-axis. This is y equals u c of t, and this is t, and it continues to be 1 uh, forevermore. So it just basically it steps up at time c. Okay, that's the unit step function. And then we have uh, uh, what we call the uh, indicator function. We're going to denote that using h of t. And it, it, it's going to be uh, the following function. First, we're going to have to we're gonna define what the function is in a, in a piecewise manner, but just before we do that, let us just identify that we're going to have two numbers and one will be less than the other. So we have uh, a bigger than zero, uh, well bigger than or equal to zero, and less than b. And then our indicator function will look like this. It will be one when t is uh, bigger than or equal to a and it will be and less than b and it will be zero otherwise. That'll be when t is less than a or t is greater than or equal to b. Okay, it's the uh, one one thing that we would say here is that this is the indicator function. Indicator function of the half open interval. There it is, a b. Okay, so what does that mean? It means, in fact, if we were to multiply h of t times something, we are just going to pick out the time between a and b where we actually want to, uh, where, where we're actually interested in what's going on. So let me just draw a picture of what that one looks like. 
pretty straightforward again. This is t. This is our indicator function here, h of t. And uh, what's happening is it's 0 coming along here until you get to a. And then uh, this is 1, and this is a. And then it continues to be 1 coming along to here. And then down here it is comes back down to 0, and this is b. So it, in fact, if you were to overlay this on top of another function, it basically doesn't change the, the function that you were overlaying. It simply it, it, it simply captures what's underneath in this time and, and blots the rest of it out, the indicator function. You could probably see fairly easily right now how you could form a square wave uh, with a um, sum of indicator functions. OK. Let us uh, take a look at how to form the indicator function in terms of the step function. So the step function is useful for writing piecewise continuous functions in a single expression. So we have uh, from the previous uh, page there, we have that uh, our indicator function looks like this. It is this function. This is just a reiteration of what was on the previous slide. OK, there it is. And now we want to write that as a sum or difference of two unit step functions. And this is the way we'll do that. Our indicator function, in fact, is u a of t minus u b of t. Why is that? Because what happens is uh, this function here steps up, go goes from 0 and steps up at time, uh, time t equals a. That, that gets you this thing happening here. And then when it gets to time b, this unit indicator function, would, uh, in fact, it sort of kicks in or also steps to 1. But because you're subtracting them, the, the, the difference here becomes 0. And then that gives you the 0 that is happening right here at this time here. So this uh, combination here of, of uh, the two step functions gives you the indicator function. And we can actually write this out in complete detail. And that this u a of t minus u b of t looks like this. 0 minus 0, which is 0 for t less than a. And it looks like this. 1 minus 0, uh, which is equal to 1. That is when t is greater than or equal to a and less than b. And then it looks like this. 1 minus 1, which is 0 for t greater than or equal to b. That is, in fact, exactly what we have there. So the indicator function can be uh, presented to you as the combination of two unit step functions. OK, let us keep going. We're just getting more exciting here. Now we're going to ask, what is the Laplace transform of the unit step function? OK, this is the unit step function at time t equals c. So we take the Laplace transform of the unit step function. And that, rate right from the definition of the Laplace transform, is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st u c of t dt. That is the definition of the Laplace transform. You must, for sure, be able to get the definition of the Laplace transform uh, out of your memory. OK, so now let's take a look, though. This is a very simple function. In fact, it's 0 until time equals c. So we can capture that by changing the lower limit of integration to c. And then after time c, it's equal to 1. So 1 times e to the minus st is simply e to the minus st. So we're left with this integral here, uh, which we can uh, easily evaluate and then take the limit. So here it is, e to the st over minus s, and then those endpoints are c and infinity. And like I explained uh, earlier, when we use this type of notation, we're not really we're not thinking of this as a number. What we are thinking of as what does this quantity become in the limit as t approaches infinity? It's a shorthand notation for that. So then we uh, uh, proceed with with that evaluation, and we get this thing here, and that's invalid for when s is equal to zero. That's when it will converge. This integral, you, you have to always be, it's an improper integral. They don't always converge. Uh, so you have to be careful that you identify for which values of s is this a convergent integral. OK, so that is uh, this thing here. I'll, I'll just box it because it's kind of the, the thing that we were trying to figure out. And we will use this frequently. That is this here. This here is the, the Laplace transform of the 
unit step function. And uh, it, in fact, it, if you take a look at that table we examined last lecture, that is formula 12 uh, in section 6.2 of uh, Boyce and De Prima. All right, so we have uh, we have the Laplace transform of the step function. Now we can ask, what's the Laplace transform of the indicator function? Well, we, we've already identified the, what the indicator function is in terms of the step function. It looks like this. There it is. Uh, so we can take the Laplace transform of h of t. And we don't have to go from the definition um, of the Laplace transform this time. Of course, we could. That might be a good exercise for you to try. But uh, we do not have to do that because we can take the Laplace transform on both sides here. And that will look like that. And then we rely on the linearity of the Laplace transform to separate this into two uh, Laplace transforms like that. And uh, then we already know the answer to these two things, so we can simply uh, combine them. And we get uh, this here, e to the minus a s over s minus e to the minus b s over s. And uh, if I would like to, and I will, uh, make that into a single fraction. So we have it like this here. There it is. So that there is the Laplace transform of the indicator function. That, so that's the Laplace transform of the indicator function. Okay, now we're going to take a look at uh, another function, the delayed forcing function. What does this mean? It means that we're going to do something, uh, but we're going to do it not at time t equals zero, we're going to do it at some uh, later time. So let f of t be some sort of function not specifying what f of t is. So let f of t be a function. Okay, and then let g of t be a delayed version of f of t. So what does that mean? It means it'll look like this. It'll be zero if t is less than c, and then it will be f of t minus c if t is greater than or equal to c. Okay, So uh, for our differential equations, this is basically going to be corresponding to a force equal to f being applied beginning at a delayed time of t equals 0, rather than being applied at time t equals uh, t equals 0. Rather than it being applied at t equals 0, the force is being applied at some time t equals c. Okay, It's easy to write this uh, delayed forcing function, g of t. Uh, as a combination of the step function and the function we are delaying. Okay. Please notice that uh, we we when we're doing this, we are using the time that the function is going to start, but we also have to make a change of variables here on the um, f of t. We have to actually d delay that function too. Okay. So that's the delayed forcing function. That allows us to then take any forcing function and move it to, to where we want in the time domain. All right, next thing to do then is to look at what the Laplace transform of the delayed forcing function is. So we're going to take a look at what is the Laplace transform of the delayed forcing function. There it is. And the, so again, we're gonna, we can go directly from the definition of the Laplace transform. The definition of the Laplace transform, the improper integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st times the uh, delayed forcing function, which we've represented in terms of the step function and the forcing function. There it is. Okay. Again, we have that situation where this is very easy to handle. It's 0 up until time c. So that means the integral we only need to actually consider the integral from time from the lower limit of c, and then it's 1 after that, so it just disappears. So then we're here, e to the minus st f of t minus c dt. Okay. Uh, in order to evaluate this integral, I'm going to make a substitution. I'm going to let g 
u equal t minus c, and then at that point, du will be equal to dt. Now I'm going to rewrite the integral here in terms of the new variable u. Now let's take a look. When u here, this is this variable here is in terms of t. We're integrating with respect to t, so this is t equals t equals c tell, to, tell, until t approaches infinity. And so now when uh, t equals c, then u is equal to c minus c, that is 0. And, uh, and when, when, um, when t is very, very large, u is also large. I mean, subtracting a finite amount isn't going to make any difference. OK, so I can rewrite my integral. It's now back to going from 0 to infinity. And then it looks like this, e to the minus s. And what is t? t is uh, u plus c. Okay. Over here we have uh, u is t minus c, so t is u plus c. And then this thing here it will be then a function of the variable u. There it is, du, okay. because uh, u is t minus c. OK, and what is that thing? Um, let, let's see, I'm looking at this, this guy here, and I'm thinking, what is that? Uh, maybe if I wrote it this way, th I would get a bit more clarity on it. Uh, do the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus su and e to the minus sc. And our function there, like that. And then taking another look at this, uh, I'm going to take a look uh, directly at this term right here. OK, so let us be very careful especially after doing a change of variables, you know, what variable are we integrating with respect to? We are integrating with respect to u. So this term that I've underlined here is independent of u. So that means we can bring it outside of the integral. So we, I'm going to do that, and I, I'm going to get that right here, e to the minus s c, and then I have here the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus u minus q du. There it is. OK. And now, when I try to get a sense of what's going on here, this thing here, in fact, is simply the Laplace transform of the original function. I mean, we have a function, some function we started with f of t. It doesn't matter if we, it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference what that variable is. That can be anything. So this is the Laplace transform. You could do, just do a this this variable can be exchanged for any letter that you wish. So uh, here we then have this is e times the Laplace transform of whatever that function was. We did we did not specify what it is f of t. Okay, so there we go. So the so when we, when you when you delay the, the onset of a forcing function, when you look at what happens to the Laplace transform, you are multiplying here by this uh, exponential. So let us just c capture that right in a single statement here at the end. We have delayed the function that we're, that we're applying to our, our system. And, and when we consider what that does to the Laplace transform of the function, we, we realize that we multiply by an, uh, an exponential. There it is, right there. And that is uh, formula 13 in our table. So we're basically generating many of those things in the table. As I mentioned in class, that table will be printed onto the examination uh, at the end of this uh, course. So you'll have it available, but you really want to see where these things are coming from. And you definitely want to be able to find Laplace transforms from the definition, from the, the improper integral definition. So this is formula 13 in the table, section 6.2, Boysen de Prima. OK, <coughs> we've got the delayed forcing function. OK, now let us take a look at how to find the Laplace transform of a piecewise continuous function. OK, so we're going to consider a pretty simple function. It's going to have one discontinuity, this function here. Consider f of t to be 1 uh, when t is between 0 and 1. And then let that same function be 1 plus t minus 1 
squared uh, when t is greater than 1. And then we're going to attempt to find out what the Laplace transform uh, of that uh, function is. So step one of this is going to be to attempt to write f of t using the unit step function in one single line so that we don't have the case-wise presentation. We would try to use, so I'm going to make an, a, a written note of that. Use u c of t for some t, for some c, so that we can write f of t in a single statement. And we don't need to use the, uh, the case, uh, uh, this uh, case-wise presentation of the function. So I'm going to do that in this manner, take f of t. I'm going to say, well, let's take a look at it. It looks like this, 1 plus 0 when t is between 0 and 1 and 1 plus t minus 1 squared uh, when uh, t is greater than 1. Okay, So then that makes it easier for me to see that this looks like this. 1 plus the unit step function happening at 1 times t minus 1 squared. Okay, So I've now rather than using the, the, the case-wise presentation from here, I have been able to rewrite the function using the unit step function here. That's good news because I know how to take the Laplace transform of that. So now I can figure out what the Laplace transform of f of t is. It is the Laplace transform of this whole thing on the, on the right hand side. There it is. And uh, I can use the linearity of the La Laplace transform in order to uh, uh, write out uh, what this is. This will then be the Laplace transform, the Laplace transform of one uh, plus, and then I recognize this as a delayed version of this function here. Okay, and I, I just hand, I just figured out how to handle that. So that is when c is one. This will be e to the minus s. Now yeah, this one right here is the c value there that I'm using times the Laplace transform of t squared. Okay. Notice it's not t minus one. Notice it's t squared. All right. So up here, I'll just I'll make a note. You could just look on the table, or or you can do it right from the definition. Uh, the Laplace transform of t squared is two over s cubed. Okay. That's coming directly from the fact that uh, the Laplace transform of t to the n is uh, n factorial over s to the n plus 1. And this, of course, is in the table. Table. OK, so we now uh, need to identify what's the Laplace transform of 1. We already know what the Laplace transform of a constant is the constant divided by s. So that is 1 over s. And then we, we've identified what this Laplace transform is. So we can now write this as 2e to the minus s over s cubed. Okay, I'm going to box that in. That is our uh, that is our answer. So we wanted to know for this function, this function, what is its Laplace transform? And we have found that it is right here. Okay, so finding Laplace transforms is is going to basically amount to doing it from the definition if the function's not in the table. Uh, if the function is not directly in the table, but you can see it as being pieces of, of different functions that are in the table, it's going to be a way of intelligently separating the function so that you can use the table. So there's there's basically two ways, right from the improper integral. Uh, that will always work, but it, of course, is more time consuming. And then there's the method of, of intelligently representing the function in terms of functions which you already know the Laplace transform of. That's going to be more efficient and quicker and will actually encompass a large number of the functions we're going to see. All right. OK, so now uh, we're going to actually start working a little bit uh, before we start solving a lot of differential equations with this. We'll start looking a little bit at how to find uh, an inverse Laplace transform because that problem is actually a little bit more difficult. So we'll do one example of that right now. I'm going to try to find the inverse Laplace transform 
of this thing here. So we imagine our situation, whether this is a function on the right-hand side, or it doesn't matter how this, uh, how this came up, but maybe it's a solution of a differential equation. And if we could just figure out what the time domain uh, equivalent of this is, we would, we would know our differential equation is solution. So we want, we want to find the Laplace, inverse Laplace transform. Okay, so the first thing to notice is we, we we're representing this with the capital uh, letter here for the function and the, the independent variables s. This is a major clue that this is, uh, you know, if we're using consistent notation, that this is a Laplace transform. And now we want to go backwards, and when we go backwards, what we want to do is find the this function, which we have as the inverse Laplace transform of this one here. Okay, that's, a, that's our objective here. Okay, so because of the way uh, these things come up uh, when we're solving differential equations, we are often, almost, I would, I'm not going to say always, but a large majority of the time, we are going to end up with rational functions for which we want to find the inverse Laplace transform. So there are some uh, techniques that you should uh, either recall or relearn, <laughs> as the case may be, and that one is going to be partial fractions. Partial fractions are, are, are extremely important, uh, that w and also completing the square. Completing the square. So these two techniques are going to come into play over and over again. Let's see uh, how that works in this case here. I'm going to, in fact, take a look at this, and I'm going to complete the square. So how do I do that? I look at, I look at these two terms, and I'm like, hey, if I went like this, s minus 1 squared, I would get this s squared minus 2s. That's, that's really good because that's what I see there, s squared minus 2s. But if, if I did that, I would just get here plus 1. And that's not what I see here. I don't see plus 1. I see plus 3. So what do I have to do then? I have to add 2 over here. Yep, and then I add 2 over here, and then I'm, I'm, I'm good. So then this thing here, uh, in this written in this form here, is exactly this thing here. So I'm going to change anything, I'm just going to complete the square. So I write g of s, so I'm in this technique right now, complete the square. So I do that, I write it this way, 1 over s minus 1 squared plus 2. And then I observe that as being f, some other function, f of s minus 1, where f where if I indicate, so I'm, I'm choosing that because of this here. I'm saying, imagine this is a function f of s minus 1. That would mean that f of s would be 1 over 2 plus s squared. Because I think what happens if I went from, like if I have f of s here, and I put, I substitute in s minus 1 for s, I get, in, in fact, exactly this here. Okay? Ah, oh, so... I can now find the uh, inverse Laplace transform of f of s. How do I do that? I look at the table and I think to myself, hmm, looking a lot like sine, but not quite. So I, I think about what I might have to do uh, to make this look like the inverse Laplace transform of a sine function. So what am I seeing on the table? Let me just notate that below. I am seeing on the table this, or I'm recalling from my memory, that the Laplace transform of the sine function, uh, where we have a constant there of a, that is a over s squared plus a squared. Okay. And then uh, here I'm, I know that the uh, that's valid for s equals zero, and I'm looking, and what does this mean? Hmm. I'm looking, and I'm looking down here, and I I, I see that. Uh, this is from the table, I see that here really what I'm being told is that uh, a squared is equal to 2. Okay, meanwhile I need to have a in the numerator. So I rewrite this in this manner, uh, square root 2 over square root 2. I multiply by 1 and I get 1 over uh, s squared plus 2. And then I can think of this part by itself. I, then I, and then I get a over s squared plus a squared. And then, I, then I'm done. That, that, that allows me to uh, figure out that the inverse Laplace transform of f of s 
is equal to 1 over root 2 times sine of root 2t, root 2t. Okay, that's the, the inverse Laplace transform of f of s. What we, when we started this project, what we actually wanted was the Laplace transform of g of s. And that uh, g of s, in fact, is f of s minus 1. And uh, we see this as a delay. So then this becomes e to the t times the Laplace transform of f of s, which we just figured out. So now the, uh, the Laplace transform of the function we were looking for looks like this. There it is. Okay, let me just write, rewrite that here. The final analysis here, the Laplace transform of 1 over s squared minus 2s plus 3, a basic quadratic um, uh, uh, function in the denominator and just the one in the numerator, a, a fairly straightforward rational function, looks like this, e to the t over root 2 sine root 2t. Two so maybe a good uh, take-home message in terms of looking at computing this Laplace transform is that, yes, I have a table, and yes, that table will always be available to me, but there's still a little bit of uh, thinking that needs to go on in order to take what you're trying to find the Lapla inverse Laplace transform of and manipulate it in a way that you can see uh, what you need from the table and then combine different elements of the table in order to produce the final result. All right, that is the end of section uh, 6.3 on the on the uh, various uh, types of functions we're going to use, uh, the, the step functions and their equivalent uh, Laplace transforms and how they are useful. Thank you very much.